So yeah, I'm Pete Woodard from Securus. I'm going to talk to you over, fortunately we finished a little bit early, so the next couple of hours I'll just be covering scratching the surface of PCI compliance and, and believe me it's a massive, massive problem and a massive risk area. And it is all about risk and credit cards, um, as you well know if, if you use them, um, they're open to abuse and obviously criminals love them because they can steal all the data and uh, pilfer money from those. So a show of hands, anyone got a credit card in the room? Okay, fine, brilliant. And anyone, the same people um, had their credit card compromised over the last 12 months? One, two, yeah, three. I know I've had my credit card compromised three times now. Um, twice, while I've been um, using it as normal, or I thought I'd been using normal, has been swiped and, and uh, forged. And once when the, uh, the bank let me know that they'd, they'd lost a disk containing personal details and they actually had my credit card details, potentially in that disk, they, they required me to delete my, uh, get rid of my credit card and issue me a new one. Not a huge problem for the consumer because slight inconvenience, you, you lose your credit card for a couple of days, the banks issue a brand new one, if you notice it's got a full PAN number as well on your letter that you get, so you put that in the bin, criminals take that from your bin. Um, that's a different problem, but uh, yeah, so you get a new card, a couple of days later, yeah, here's my new card, you go out again, use it. No problem really, it's just a, me, just a, a minor inconvenience. So. The banks cover the cost of that at the moment, and that costs around $12 at the moment for the bank to cover that process for you. Stolen credit card details on the dark net um, are currently trading for two, three dollars per usable credit card um, detail. So there's a bit of a swing there, and the risk areas for the bank is obviously is growing, and that is now being forced down to the um, merchant level. So. of an agenda so we'll talk about merchants in a minute but um, we're going to cover some of the, the, the really scratching the surface here of PCI compliance um, as you can imagine if you even look at into that industry that's there's some huge areas that we need to, to cover off there so what is PCI DSS it's payment card industry data security standard this is a standard for anybody who stores, processes, or transmit cardholder data. If you do any of those things, you need to be compliant. Whoops. It's out of control. Right, so it's founded by the five, five um, card brands here. Um, and they, they, they talk to industry, they talk to the, um, the people, the merchants, the acquirers, everybody else who, who deals with these card uh, transactions and they report back to the council who develop the standards, the PCI standard, which is then f um, propagated to, to the merchant level and service provider level. The payment card industry security standards council is a very uh, confusing market, very uh, full, full of acronyms and it's like speaking a different language sometimes. What do they do? Well, that, that's the um, official line of what they do. They're an independent standards body. What they actually do, this is the official spiel, they help merchants operate card payment systems securely. So if you're a merchant, you go to your bank, you need a merchant account, they give you all the, well, everything to do with that. These guys govern that and make sure you operate your card payment systems in a secure manner. Before I move on, they also... <laughs> They help vendors who create, who, who make these PIN cards and the, uh, the near field technology devices and software, the hardware pieces that go with this payment system. They ensure that the vendors of these solutions are actually compliant and secure as well. So it goes back to some of the early discussions we've had today where they're trying to embed security within the, the, the top level and um, the design level. You might think, why, why is all this important? Because as a consumer, it doesn't really matter if a card data gets stolen, I, I just simply apply for a new one from the bank. Well, it may not affect the consumer, but it ultimately has a cost that we end up paying to cover the cost of uh, recovering data and, and lost card breaches, etc. Um, I'll put some numbers up here. It's purely around um, a survey that's carried out by Forrester Consulting. 81% store payment card numbers. Now, if you're a merchant and you're storing card de details, why? <laughs> you're, you're completely at risk by storing these data, uh, this card data. It's imperative that, well, it's not imperative, but it, it is advised that if you deal with card data, then try not to store it because that 
opens up uh, an attack vector. We saw Paul earlier demonstrate how easy it is to get onto a website. He won't be taking um, files and things off your server. He'll be taking card details, and there'll be thousands of them. So imperative not to store it. If you can do, if you can run a merchant account without transacting physical card data, then it's, it's always advisable to, to outsource that section if you can, and reduce your scope. Um, a couple of things, the last couple of days now, I think like within the last three days, Tesco's bank has had a, um, a card breach and it was reported via MasterCard. There's a big mechanism of reporting um, process that goes on within the card brands. So MasterCard report back to Tesco's bank and say, excuse me, we've had some breaches on your, your cards that you've issued and we're blocking a load of accounts and, and they know it's not in the public domain yet, but they know which retailer it is that's at fault as well. So you've got a few elements here. You've got the Tesco's bank who issued the card to the consumer. The consumers use that card, the MasterCard, against a, an online retailer, for instance. That online, online retailer has been hacked, has put malware in, it's stolen credit card details, and ultimately the bank will get a report. I think my card's been breached. That will report back to the bank. And that's the whole cycle of uh, looking at remediating that now. Some of the high profile card breaches over the last few years. Target. Target I'll, I'll pick on because it's just a target really. Um, so they've had a, um, a breach which, which came from their trusted third party entity. So they have a third party company that monitors their air conditioned units etc around, around their stores. Target themselves are probably really compliant and really um, um, secure in the way they operate. However, they had a trusted partner that could go penetrate straight into their network. The attack profile there is um, that people were looking at their, their third party providers, they compromised one of their trusted accounts, got on the network, escalated privileges, etc., and uh, pilfered um, over 40 million credit card details. There's a whole lot of other personal information data stolen at the same time, but in terms of card, card details, that's uh, quite a lot there. But I think they were covered because they had cyber insurance, so I think we're, they're quite good on, on that side of things. Um, Hilton Hotels, another, this is a slightly different attack vector. They're, they're using the point of sale um, attack vector where they, they install uh, malware and that, that intercepts card data as it's literally swiped or, or touched. Um, so there's a piece of malware that sits in between that and that pilfers off um, the, the uh, the cardholder data. Um, there used to be uh, back off one of the malware um, in case you want to look into this, but yeah, it used, uh, used to be back off and then there's another uh, program that they use now which is uh, Poseidon, which is a, an enhancement of that if you like. Because you have to remember the criminals are constantly developing their software to, to counteract the, the security things that uh, card, um, card manufacturers are actually placing on these. And if you notice Back in the day, when you used to swipe your card, that was very prone to um, uh, fraudulent card use where you just get a um, masked card, the magnetic stripe would be copied onto any other card for swiping. Um, as soon as chip enabled cards were, were pushed out, then that, that attack vector then went from the physical to the online market and the mail order, telephone order area. So. The, the, the criminals are constantly uh, aware of what's going on and, and how, the, how they um, can counteract the, the security measures that we're putting in place all the time. You've seen that before, haven't you? Okay, so hotels, there's another good source of um, card data. Um, I'm not sure how many people who visited hotels, you, you might have the uh, during the later hours in the evening, the, the, the guy on the front desk or the girl on the front desk just pretty bored, just clicking through emails, surfing the internet, that sort of thing. They're quite easy to get um, onto those machines, get malware onto these machines. And also, it's very close to the customer, the client, so while someone's away from the desk, someone could quite easily get around and they're generally logged on at that point. And you know, you can, you can actually manipulate some of these uh, card machines and the physical environment. Not so much now with skimming, where you, do, you put a hardware device in to, to skim pay. It's not so common at the moment, because obviously it's quite high risk. Quite, um, there's probably small gains from a skimming machine on a hotel card machine when they could actually go to the hotel website, hack that, and then pull a lot more um, credit card details off that. And, uh, criminals are obviously after the, the high returns on the low risk all the time. 
Trump Hotel collection that confirms car breach. So when have you uh, Whenever you're in the public domain and you're, you're ever popular and people really um, see you as uh, being a, a great public figure and that there's always those criminal element that would um, like to take you down and some of the ways that they do this is you know, via the malicious sort of attack in here and this is a classic example of another payment card, um, I think there's yeah, a point of sale uh, breach here. Again, another example here of uh, a malware-driven card breach here at Hyatt Hotel. So the attack vectors tend to be similar. Um, what works for hotels will obviously work for other areas of, of industry. We see a lot of um, um, a lot of hotels, uh, car hire places, uh, where, where there's going to be a, a large collection of different credit card vendors in use. You, you'll find um, people will try. Uh, peeling off those uh, details here. <clears throat> so who needs who needs to be compliant? Okay, so a merchant needs to be compliant. Anyone who takes Visa, Mastercard, JCB, Discovery, etc. Those five car brands are the core element here. So anyone who takes those as payment, then they need to be um, they need to be compliant. Service providers. A service provider would be. Let's say you're a merchant and you want to take you, you take Visa card, but you want to take Mastercard, Amex, all this sort of stuff. You you would engage typically engage with a um, a service provider, and that would be a payment service provider. So they can offer all sorts of payment methods and payment uh, solutions for you, and you just pay one monthly fee to the payment service provider, who would provide that as a service. What they typically offer for the for the merchant would be security, transaction reporting, different type of card payments, you know, online, etc. that sort of thing. So that would be um, a payment provider. Think of um, Streamline, PayPoints, WorldPay, those sort of people that cover that. And any other entity that could impact the security of their credit card. So the, the key word here is impact security of the credit card. So if, if you run a, if you outsource a lot of, um, so let's say your backups, you're storing credit card details or for whatever reason, you've got a backup solution, it's in the cloud, who's that, who's providing that for you? Are they compliant? They need to be compliant. You need to have rigid agreements in place to understand what happens on a card breach, who's responsible, is it you, is it them? You have a duty of, um, a duty of care, not only that, but a duty of um, compliance to, to conform with PCI standards that you have taken proper due diligence with your third parties that could have an impact in your, in your effectively your credit card um, area. A simple, simple route to compliance, scoping the assessment and then the reporting. <clears throat> scoping, um, we've seen quite a few interesting uh, companies when, when we go to scope certain solutions, uh, certain businesses and um, some of the solutions that are in place we've had clients that we have merchant clients that want to bring all that in-house because they don't trust anybody else outside and it's like well you're introducing this risk back into your own business so in fact what you want to be doing is farming it out as much as you can to minimize your impact to your business um, over scoping so if you're protecting a network and it's all within the compliance standard controls and there's over 320 of them at the moment, version 3.1, if you're scoping an environment to, to become secure then if you're looking at email servers, backup servers, um, web servers, the whole infrastructure could be absolutely massive. So if you can reduce that element to have a, a payment secure network if you like and cut out all the rest of the stuff then great. If you over scope, for instance, you're going to pull in a lot more um, time, effort, money, money um, value on, on getting them to a compliant state. And consequently, uh, or adversely, if you um, under scope, i.e. You, you don't encompass the whole of the PCI environment, uh, the card environment within that business, if you under scope, you're going to potentially put card data at risk by not including that within that secure environment. Then you do um, assessment here, so the QSA, Qualified Security Assessor, who's verified and qualified by PCI Council, will make sure, will come to site and basically assess you against the scope of compliance. 
our top tip, if your QSA company that you're engaged with to do this work, if they say, don't worry about it, we can do that remotely, then it's probably time to look at a different QSA company because there's no way you can do that without being on site. It's all about people, process, a little bit of technology. We touch on those elements today as well, but um, it's all about people. It's all about, sometimes about process changes. For instance, if you're taking card payments over the telephone and it's on a, an IP phone system and it's on the, the general network that you work within your environment, the process might be telephone orders now go to a different PC that has a dedicated internet connection, secure environment, and getting people to change the way of taking payments can be quite a lot more difficult than uh, chucking a shiny box in the corner that will apparently do it all. What's involved? Um, so the QSA will come aside, he'll go through all the documentation, verify everything's in place. These are just a couple of things they'll do. Um, they'll validate the scope obviously, and then they'll put together a report. The report will actually go to your acquiring bank to say, we sign off then say, company XYZ is compliant with the PCI Council security standard. Here's proof that we've checked it all, this is tested, etc. We sign off. Merchant, uh, the acquiring bank then will say, Thank you very much, we're now in a compliant state. So the risk shifts from that point onwards, and the risk then goes back to the bank and say, Well, the merchant isn't at risk um, from card breaches now because they are compliant or they've conformed with the compliance. You have to remember as well that the compliance assessment is a moment in time. Check on how you are. So you get a week before we come in, you put all the good stuff in place, we come in and assess it, fantastic. We go away the next day, you rip out your firewalls, chuck a couple of netgear, hubs in, you know, you, you have to understand it's a moment in time um, assessment. The report, report back on different levels and like I say, we're scratching the surface here but I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail about what reporting levels but level one merchant would be more than 6 million transactions per year. Uh, so think large retail, multi-site retail companies. Level four being the lowest, so single high street shop, shoe shop, something like that. And again, the payment brands will determine what level of reporting and whether it's self-assessment, a QSA, verification, all these sort of elements all tie into what Barclays require, what um, HSBC require, whatever your merchant, um, whatever your acquiring bank requirements, we report to their, their satisfaction. PCI is not an enforcer of these rules. The, um, some people think the PCI Council actually govern this. Or we, we do govern this, they, they, um, we enforce this. There's no enforcement here. This is purely um, the card brands that enforce everything. So, and, the, and the merchant, uh, the acquiring bank. I keep saying merchant, acquiring bank. Um, so a little bit about um, SAQs or SACs, as we like to call them. Um, Again, the different levels of SAQ, whether you're um, mail order, telephone order, SAC A, for instance, would be a complete non-face-to-face -face environment. You get different levels of SAQ, so you might have over IP, might be over P PSCN. There's a whole myriad of um, information around that, and I'm not going to go into any detail about that because uh, when I like to go out, you'll all be asleep. <clears throat> so. A few observations from, uh, from a QSA, um, large companies, we, we see all sorts of things, we, we've been on site doing assessments and a company in question has categorically said we do not keep cardholder uh, receipts with full PAN primary account number, full account number details on there with uh, CVV codes and authorization codes, absolutely no chance. So we go on site to do an assessment. While I'm waiting for someone to log into the firewall, there's a bag on the desk. There's like 2,000 card receipts from airline. You know when you're on an airline, you buy something on, on flight, they swipe your card. All those receipts in a great big bag, open. I'm just looking through them, and there's something about equivalent of 200,000 pounds worth of card receipts in there. And it's like, oh yeah, we don't, we don't have any card receipts. Uh, okay, so you, you find these sort of things. The larger companies, um, very complex. Um, and they're very process driven we find. Um, for an example, working with a really large uh, retail group at the moment and a, um, a simple thing requires um, sign off, authorization from all sorts of different departments. You've got a program 
sponsor, you've got the, the data owner, the program delivery team, you've got 10 day lead times on most changes, you've got technical risk mitigation planning, you've got back out planning, disaster recovery stuff, you've got all sorts of elements to do a simple change and um, we find that the slow, slow moving and, um, and high cost and you know the process are there for, for that re for, for a reason obviously to, to protect themselves but it can be um, someone might typically say well how long does it take to become PCI compliant we're a large retail well how long is a piece of string you know we have to work with them on, on devising a, a plan and some of these projects can take you know, three to 18 months, depending on size of company, etc. Smaller companies, <clears throat> they tend to be dynamic and easy to, do, to adapt to change. Um, and they, they're running with the new technology, Apple Pay, you've got near field technology stuff that's coming out. And um, a couple of examples, a couple of examples I'll tell you about. I've got mobile hairdressers and a mobile taxi firm. Well, mobile, have, you ever, have you ever heard of a non-mobile taxi firm? Anyway, so yeah, taxi firms, a classic example, you jump in a taxi, damn, I've got no money, pay by card, yeah, I've got a smartphone, I've got a jack, in a headphone jack goes uh, near field technology device. Just whack your card on there, it'll, uh, it'll take payment, it'll go through an application in the phone using 3G, Wi-Fi, uh, 4G, whatever, whatever is available. Um, and it's secure and it's encrypted from the point you swipe it, so it goes straight to the acquiring bank in an encrypted method. Mobile hairdresser is another example. It might be on you know, at someone's home and they can pay by credit card now. There's, a, there's another device that's come out which is being launched by Barclay Card. Uh, it's an actual pin pad, so you can put your card in, press your pin. Works on the same headphone jack. So there's a lot of technology, and the smaller companies here now are actually seeing. Um, let's go back to the taxi example. Um, so if you don't take cash, that's limiting your market potentially. So you take that passenger to the cash point machine, and if obviously if after a night out, they're in a suitable state to draw cash out of a cash machine, you, no one wants to really be in that situation. So if you can offer card payments, then that's that's a great use of technology. But it comes with the risks that we just um, mentioned there. And already, it's any questions? <laughs>